Okay. Any comments? I would love to hear some comments or questions on that. Actually, I would just like to interject here that apparently we weren't already recording. So I just want to, um, I don't want to not put any of your video on our, on our um, social media. Of course, all of the video in full will be on Facebook, but for those of you watching on other platforms, we're Creation Fellowship Santee and we're live tonight with Bill Morgan, our guest who's talking about the amazing eye. And if you want to watch the video in its entirety, you can visit our Facebook um, page, Creation Fellowship Santee. Okay, go ahead, Bill. Okay, so any comments or questions on the two muscles that stabilize things so that when your head is tilting, objects are not jumping all over the place that they're, they're stabilized. Okay, guess not. We'll move on. Um, I have one. Sure. Um, apparently, um, <clears throat> when I tilted my head to the left and to the right, the line moved, but the line was not moving. It was me that was trying to adjust my line, uh, adjust uh, for the movement of my head. The line was still, and I have to figure out that it's, uh, it was I who was doing this. Okay. And if we only had four muscles, if you tilted your computer monitor, that's how it would look as you move your head. Yeah. And earlier, someone said they have vertigo. Man, we'd be seasick all the time if things were moving like that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, James, yes. for sharing that. That's me. I have vertigo, and I'm often seasick. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Any more comments, anybody, as we move on? I got a quick question. Sure. When we sleep, is mm. that muscle still the most active muscle, or does the heart become the most active muscle when we're sleeping? That is a great question, and I actually do have an answer to that. Even when you're sleeping, like during REM sleep, your eyes move a lot. Uh, have you ever noticed someone sleeping and their eyes are twitching during their REM phase of their sleep? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I know for a fact my dog has massive REM sleep. She she has nightmares all the time. But yes, our eyes are even moving when we're asleep. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's an honor to be with you guys. We're going to talk about only six parts of the eye. And I could have quizzed you, but those are some of the names that we're going to talk about. Okay. When Mo poked Larry in the brain, what part of the eye did he hit? The cornea. The cornea is the outside part of your eye. Cornea. Do you guys think that the cornea is the result of a design by a god with an IQ of infinity or the product of properly arranged stardust? I would like to take some answers, please. <laughs> I'll take one answer. Go for it, James, you answer. Uh, with a God with a brain. Amen, oh, Absolutely. Amen. Yes. Creationists believe vision is the result of design. The definition of design is the result of a plan, something that's intentional. What's the definition of chance? something that is not planned. The reason I do this is I've talked to evolutionists who love to play word games. They say, well, does, define design. Okay, plan. Chance, not plan. So the I is one of the other. It's a duality. I think the I is a design. Yeah. Let's talk. And the fun part of this, guys, is we could get into the details of the cornea, which we won't, too deeply and each stage is so incredibly complex but i'm going to keep it on the fifth grade level because that's what i like to be at god does not make things now i heard this from another speaker i thought it was a great point you might think what a what a hedonist to say that god makes systems systems in my definition are composed of many many things usually many many other systems do you follow me mm -hmm. so everything that god makes is a system 
is a stack of cards a system? Are there many components to a stack of cards? Yeah. yeah. What happens if we pull just one card? <laughs> we make a mess. Yep, everything falls. Our vision is an incredible system where a million things have to work. And if one thing doesn't work, we could be blind. So let's move on. Wow. Any comments on the person who said, wow, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, yes, the amazing complexity and uh, the fact that uh, it all has to work. I'm thinking of my own eyes. And um, I see many uh, of my friends who do not have good eyes. They're nearly blind. And um, so I can relate to them with this also. And uh, we can pray for them, but it's typically one thing that's not working. And sadly, they could lose their vision. But yes. all of these things need to work for us to see. Okay. So here, wait, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to talk to you about the cornea for a second. Blood, okay, every tissue in the human body requires oxygen. What is the only tissue in the human body that gets oxygen not from blood? What? I never thought of that. The Could only, that be there's blood? only one tissue. With, I'm sorry? Something about the eye. Right. But there's only one tissue in the eye that does not get oxygen from blood. The cornea. The cornea. <laughs> Let's talk what? about this. Why did, does God not deliver oxygen to the cornea through blood? It would block your vision. You could not see. If I poured blood on your windshield, would you be real happy with me? You'd say, hey, you knucklehead, I can't see. Well, our cornea is like a windshield, and it's the only tissue in our, bi in our body, not our Bible, in our body that gets oxygen from the environment, from our surroundings. <laughs> Any comments on that? Amazing. Now, in the past, contact lenses, when they first came out, some of them weren't really well designed. And they said, do not leave your contact lenses on too long. Oh, if people boy. did not change their contact lenses in the past, they were not getting oxygen to their cornea. Guess what happened? Well, for one thing, their eyes would get very dry. Okay. And sometimes the contacts would stick to their eyes. Ugh. Okay. And I'm wondering if ultimately they could lose their vision that way. This is amazing. If the eye was not getting oxygen from the air and the cornea, guess what would happen? The tissue would die. No. No. God has a plan B. All of a sudden, your body would start growing blood vessels to supply oxygen to the eye. <laughs> Can you believe the complexity of that design? Is that why people get like, so then would they have like, if you get red eyes, like, um, you know, like something irritates your eye and they, and it gets red. Is that why? I do not know the answer to that great question, or, but some or people it, have very bloodshot eyes. Yeah, bloodshot. Yeah. It could be just enlarged blood vessels, but I'm not sure. And don't, isn't it true? I don't, I'm not speaking from experience here, but isn't it true that when people drink a lot, they get bloodshot eyes? I wonder if that has to do with their oxygen being depleted. Hmm. Well, it could raise their blood Sweet. pressure. And if we rub our eyes, they turn red. You know, we increase the friction and perhaps the blood pressure on that. But uh, I'm not sure about that. But it's almost like a factory where the brain gets a report, uh, excuse me, this is the eye reporting. Yes, report eye. Uh, we're low on oxygen on our cornea. Okay, let's get the blood making department to build some pipes to deliver the oxygen. 
what an amazing system the human body is. So, but nowadays contact lenses allow oxygen to the eye. So we, we go over slides where we did these. We're gonna talk about what happens when you pass from the darkness to the light. What happens, everybody? Your pupils change size. Yes. Correct. And a little double entendre there that I hope you enjoy. The iris and the pupil. But here's a funny thing. Your pupil does not change its size. The iris changes its size. Okay. You follow me? Yep. Your pupil People say your pupil dilates, and I'm no eye doctor, but I don't think the dilates. I think the iris changes. So yeah. yes. if you are in the dark, you got a lot of pupil that receives light. When it gets bright, it's small. So, you know, next time, guys, you go, and ladies, you go from a bright sunlight to a dark room, glorify God as your eyes start to adjust and you see. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So do you think the process of pupils and irises dilating is the result of design or properly arranged stardust? <laughs> you guys decide. This that is, would have but, to be some pretty incredible stardust. Uh, with information and measurement capability. It's, it's just criminal that the kids are being taught this nonsense. So the light goes into our eye. And uh, the ganglion cells, I'll keep it simple, tell the brain, hey, we need more light, or hey, we have too much light. So even right now, our brain is receiving information and sending information to control our iris. Okay. Any comments on that? Is, is the iris changing size? Is that, that's not a muscle, right? There it is. It is muscles. Oh. Muscle fiber. Is my bar there? Is, can you guys see my bar? My uh, yeah. task bar? Yes. No. Yeah. We just see the your presentation. I'll show you what a newbie I am. How do I get rid of my task bar? I Anybody, you know, do, do I click that? Escape? Wait, you're trying I to... I think escape. I think. No, escape will take okay. you out of your presentation. Okay, I think I'll just leave it and move it around. Okay. okay. Well, we so muscle it. fiber, okay, good. I don't want you guys to it. The muscle fiber controls the opening and closing of the iris. But since I'm a full service uh, teacher, I showed you a diagram. Unbelievable. Some muscles move axially like away from it, the axis, and some move radially mm. to dilate. Uh, I mean, just the drawing alone is a beautiful design, but God made muscle fibers to close in a circle. <laughs> Woo! Any comments on that, anybody? I, I have a comment, because if you um, have a camera, like, you know, and it has a lens cover, a lot of lens covers are designed to close in a circle also. And so, so it's just one example, I'm sure of many, 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 many of biomimicry where God created it first and he designed it first. And then we've copied the design because we can't do any better than that. So, so we use that and apply it to other, other things, mm. other systems. And, amen. Any other comments? Thank you for sharing that. That was great. Is there anything else in our body that would um, require this type of muscle structure? You know what? I'm not sure how sphincter muscles work, but I would bet you a penny because I'm a big gambler that sphincter muscles work like this. And you know what those are, right? Um, hmm. our, our digestive system has several sphincter muscles. Oh. When food passes from one area to another, it closes. So each oh. quote, station can take care of it, like the esophagus, yeah. the stomach, the small intestine, and not to be disgusting, thank goodness we have them in our rectum or else we'd be, you know, leaving a trail all day. You actually <laughs> spoke to us about um, the digestive system before. 
So oh, that's okay. one of our videos on our um, YouTube channel and other channels mm. that people can watch. Okay, good. What a beautiful gun. That's yeah. not popular in Stardust. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the pupil. It is the same as the aperture in a camera. And what's the definition of an aperture? It's something that opens to allow light. So Terry, we did, we did not collaborate on this at all. Completely independently, she compared it to a camera. And the aperture allows light. Hmm. I love this stuff. Feedback control systems. Don't worry, it might sound scary, but it's not. A simple feedback control system is suppose you go camping in Mammoth or to a cabin in Mammoth in the wintertime and it's really, really cold and you want that cabin warmed up. Besides the fire, you might turn a thermostat on. What does a thermostat do? I'll take one answer from one of the audience. Uh, You're in a cabin with a furnace and a thermostat you turn on the thermostat up to 78 degrees what's the thermostat doing it regulates the temperature exactly the thermostat is saying hey furnace give me some heat so the furnace obeys turns on the heat and once the thermostat reads 78 degrees what does it do it stops yep that's called a feedback control system Based oh. on what's going on, it turns on and it turns off. Does oh. a feedback control system sound like a design to you guys? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It does yeah. not sound like it's an accident. <laughs> and, and, and what's more important for the system to work, the thermostat or the furnace? They're both equally essential. Amen? Mm-hmm. Yeah, With evolution yeah. nonsense, you cannot have a system evolve. You need everything in the system working at once. Bingo. Okay. Wow. Whoever said wow, would you like to comment? Uh, that's some kind of a revelation. I never thought of that. Yeah. Uh, are you an engineer? To, or, no, yeah. everything would have to evolve at once. Yeah. yeah. Well, I thought you evolution evolve. took millions of years. Mm. so so they, well, I'm not, that's what they say so that means both the 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 thermostat and the heater itself would have had to learn how to talk to each other and evolved at the same time not right. over millions of years and some things for you to live they'd have to evolve within nanoseconds of each other oh, there you go i and believe that we call that irreducible complexity. And what, and I'm not smart. I call it a system, but it's, a, <laughs> I believe it's the same thing. Yes. And, and I love Behe and his writings, but it's basically, it's just a system. Thermostat, furnace, both essential. And both of those are systems. The furnace is a system. The thermostat is a system. It never stops through God's greatness and complexity. I debated on YouTube. My channel, if you're interested, is Bill Morgan Channel. I debated a genius. His name was Ron Garrett. We had a very, very friendly debate. He helped design the Mars rover. Oh, my. So he was, and for Google, he helped design the Google Translator. But sadly, he's an atheist, and uh, I like the guy very much, but he's absolutely a bitter atheist. But that's besides the point a little bit. But during my debate, I used this slide with them. I said, uh, Dr. Garrett, the Mars rover has 23 eyes. Are these eyes the result of designer chance on the Mars rover? <laughs> well, he worked on the Mars rover. He put a lot of time into it, I'm sure. Of course, they're the result of design. Nobody would believe they happened by chance. But our eyes are infinitely more complex than the Mars rover eyes. Okay? So, how do brilliant people in science 
see this and conclude it's not the result of design? I'll take a couple answers. Uh, they're deceived. Some people are innocently brainwashed and deceived into constantly being told this by chance. Absolutely. That was me for 12 years. And the other reason is they've suffered so much and we got to have compassion for them. I believe they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and someone died or the abuse never stopped or the divorce didn't stop. And people break and reach a point where they say, I'm done with you. I've tried, I've prayed, you've let me down and they fight God. Hmm. Nobody studies this though with an open scientific mind and say, yeah, that could have happened by chance. The fool says in their what? Heart. Heart, there is no God. Yeah. But a lot of young people are brainwashed that if you love science, you've got to love this atheist nonsense. And that's a shame. So um, what we're looking at here seems to be um, involved with information. And information uh, that um, comes with the system, uh, develops with the system, or information that is from the outside is put into this, the system as it develops external. And I can see um, Stardust would have to be internal. Mm. Uh, mm. That's, that doesn't make sense. Um, mm. It has to be external uh, to be logical, I think. Brilliant. Very good, James. And just the, the cabin, the thermostat, <laughs> and the furnace, does information need to be imputed for that system? Yes, you have to set yeah, the thermostat sure. and turn it on. Matter does yeah. not have information, but our body does. It's it's imputed yeah. by God. Hmm. And when we're dead, no more information. Nothing's hmm. going to react. Hmm. All right, let's talk about the lens. I think it's a design. Some people think it's a properly arranged stardust. I'll speed it up just a little bit. Little lens trivia, there's two types of lenses. If you wear glasses, you've got one of two types of lenses, most likely. You won't get into bifocals. But the light is always directed towards the thicker part of the lens because it, it slows it down and it focuses, okay? So you guys see that, right? Mm -hmm. Two types of lenses uh, do two different things with lights. So either focalize focals it or whatever or spreads it wider mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so the lens reaches a focal point okay do you think god knows about lenses lights and focal points <laughs> he sure does so the light contracts and converges to a focal point and of course god knows that so how does the INR lens work? Suppose you're looking at a stop sign. It receives light. The lens focuses. And the goal of the lens is for the light to hit the retina, for the focal point to be on our retina. You see that? Mm -hmm. What happens if the focal point does not hit the retina? We need glasses. It's blurry. Yeah, it's hard to see. It's yeah, not focused. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I love this stuff. How do eye lenses cause the light to have the focal point on the retina? Ladies and gentlemen, buckle <laughs> your seatbelts. Your lenses are bending all day long. Your lenses are bending. So you could either look at a tiny little ant or a distant star. Any wows or amens for that? Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Amen. Anybody yeah, care to amen. share? <laughs> and I believe when we get older, they're not as flexible, perhaps, and we're more likely to uh, need glasses. Yeah. But that blows. And is this a feedback control system? You're looking at something and your lens is bent. That mm. is the feedback control system. Your body has millions oh. and millions of them. Oh. So, 
and I'm going to make my PowerPoint available. I'll send it to Terry, and you guys can use this as much as you want. So if you're looking at a distant star, your lens looks like a football, to use a technical term, so the light focuses on the retina. If you're looking at one of my favorite animals, the ant, I love ants, but not in my house, your lens is more like a basketball to focus on the retina. Any comments on that? And what's, what's the mechanism for the, that lens to ex expand and contract? It's not muscular, I assume. Yes, it is. There's it cells. Isn't. I believe they're called ganglion cells. I think we're going to get to that. Or ciliary muscles. See that? Very good at question. Yeah, ciliary. The muscles, those ciliary muscles are doing that. And your, your beautiful, your precious brain is getting data all day long for this and processing the data to control your lens. I'm almost teary-eyed. I get so excited with this stuff. Yeah. Who would like to read that? The first person to start reading gets to read that verse. Go for it, Bill. Other Bill. Praise the Lord and highly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. No word. Unsearchable is a good word, but not even close to his greatness. So how, then someone asked, how does the eye lens bend? ciliary muscles, which I'm sure could be a six month lesson on how they work. But the muscles bend yeah. the lens. Love it. Okay. Now, this is something I love. Fifth grade level question. The lens does five fine tuning for focusing light. But guess what part of your eye does most of the refracting of light? The lens fine tunes. Guess what part of the eye does most of the focusing? Yes. Optic nerve. Yes. Cornea. Back to the cornea, the cornea again. Oh, yeah. I appreciate the guess. The cornea does most of it. Our lens fine tunes it. Huh. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Okay, which, and I use this in one of my debates with one of my atheist buddies. Which lenses are the result of design? The lenses in her glasses or the yes. lenses in her eyes? Yes. What oh. do you think an atheist oh. would say? Well, an atheist would only say yeah. the other, her glasses. Her glasses exactly. only, yes. Wait, when you put it up there like that, the contrast is so devastating it would seem to the atheist but he'd come up with a rescuing device well, well i i don't know one could one could maybe argue that they both require design i think that's what a creationist would say that's creationist yeah i would say as a creationist both are the result of design yeah. an atheist would say only the glasses that she bought at walmart but I once role played an atheist in a debate. And when I left, I felt dirty. I felt like such a liar and deceitful person because I was spewing things I knew that weren't true. And they know the PhDs know our arguments better than we do. But I believe they're just pushing their agenda because they're either mad at God or scared to death they'll get fired. Mm. But the innocent yeah. people are being lost. Yeah. But they're both yeah. a design. So real quick, how do your glasses work? If you're looking at a light or a clock on a tower, if it's beautifully focused, that means the light is hitting your retina, the focal point, you don't need glasses. If the focal point is short, you're nearsighted and you would need a lens to expand the light. Okay. If the focal point is behind your retina, that means you're farsighted and you need a lens to contract the light. So again, just a quick lesson on the type of lenses that we need. Okay. So nearsighted people, 
the focal point is short, far sighted is too far, but we'll press on because of time. Next up, the retina. The retina is like film in a camera. Just the drawing alone should tell someone that there's a mighty God, that mm. this is what your retina looks like. I couldn't even draw that, much less build it and design it and make it functional too. <laughs> How many people have heard of rods and cones? Yeah. Here. No shame, no guilt. How many people are not sure what they do? Any of you? I have read about it before, but I don't remember it. Okay. Well, I'm going to share on the fifth grade level, and I hope you never forget it because it's my explanation is so simple, but the complexity is mind boggling. Oh. Rods and cones are photo receptors. Let me tell you what rods and cones do. Rods are for black, gray, and white light. Cones are for colored light. But what they do, and this is fifth grade level, they turn light into an electrical impulse. Dramatic pause. Rods and cones receive light and turn it into an electrical impulse that travels to the optic nerve and goes where? To the brain. To our wonderful brain. brain. And our wonderful brain is processing the electrical impulse for vision. I need a volunteer and you won't be embarrassed. Who would like to volunteer? I'm going to volunteer Jeff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Yeah. Take your eye off the screens and your the screen and just briefly describe what you see. I'm not, my eyes aren't on the screen, they're in my head. <laughs> good point, very good. All right, take what your eyes are looking at off the screen and look at something in your room. Okay. Describe what you see. I'm looking at a picture of a ship. And what color do you see? It's blue with silver highlights. Okay. So the light is going into the alpha rat's brain, hits his rods and cones, electrical signal goes to the brain, and the brain is saying, oh, it's silver, gray, blue, and white, and this size. There's shadowing and shading. How in the world could that be properly arranged stardust? Unbelievable yeah. complexity. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, we'll press on. So the electrical impulse goes to the optic nerve that goes to the brain. But a, a fun trivia question, guess how many rods are in each eye and how many cones are in each eye? I'll take one volunteer to guess and there's no shame. 2,000. Okay, good guess. The area is about the size of a quarter. There's 120 million rods behind oh. each one of your eyes. Mm. Oops. Mm. And 7 million cones. Now think of our creator. Our creator is thinking, hmm, how many rods will they need? I'll give them 120 million, that'll be perfect. How many cones? Seven million, and he spoke it into existence. Is that is that what gives us pretty good resolution on the things we see? I wonder, like, would a hawk that has even way better vision? Would they have more cones and rods, perhaps? I would think. I'm just guessing here. They would have perhaps a better lens, but I could be dead wrong. But this would cause someone to be colorblind. Perhaps dogs, and I still don't fully believe it. They say dogs can't see colors. They don't have as many cones, but they might have more rods. Because mm. my dog used to recognize our car from a distance, and I figured it had to be the color, not just the shape. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great question. And if you don't mind looking that up on your phone, I'd be love to hear what you said. Like. What is it about the hawk eye that they can see 
better than us at a distance. I only have a dumb phone. I can't look up the internet on my phone. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. But if somebody would like to do that, like why do hawks have better vision? This is a simple question uh, a three-year-old could answer. Uh, why do you think they're called rods and cones? Because <laughs> of their shape. Quiz review time, ready? What do rods and cones do? They process light. Why do hawks have better vision than humans? Yep, they convert light into an electrical impulse that goes to our brain. Stardust can't do that. And electrical signals go to the visual cortex. Just look at that beautiful optic nerve. I like that picture quite a bit. Okay. Now, you need the back of your head you see stars. <laughs> Who wants to guess the diameter of the optic nerve? I'm going to guess that it's half a millimeter. It's a tenth of an inch. Good guess. So I appreciate the participation. It's a I'm tenth of an inch. And I'm going to guess 100 microns. Okay. Wow. Sometimes when I evangelize, I tell people your optic nerve is a tenth of an inch. And that little tenth of an inch, guess how many nerve fibers are in it? <laughs> 1. 1.7 million nerve fibers in a tenth of an inch for us to have vision. Who would like to read this beautiful verse? I'll read it. Sing to him, sing psalms to him. Talk you of all his wondrous works. First Chronicles 16.9. Amen. Do you think an atheist would agree that wires, a conductor that's insulated, is the result of design? Of course. Wires don't happen by chance. The optic nerve is a conductor of an electrical signal. That's a design and so is that. Here comes my dog. Come on up, honey. She wants to get out of my bed. Come on. Very obedient. My most obedient child. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the visual cortex. Now, here is a question from the internet. Solving the problem of converting light into ideas of visually understanding features and objects in the world is a complex text far beyond the abilities of the world's most powerful computers. Well, how could it happen by chance then? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Now, did, your draw, did your dog draw those blue lines on your screen? You know what? I moved my feet for my dog to get up there and somehow I think I drew it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can, but Bill, random chance. Go ahead. Bill, this is Bill again. Um, I'm not just saying this, but while you were showing us the, those, all those small nerve fibers, then going through this fairly small cortex there, um, I thought that sounds like a computer and, it, and the electrical impulses, that's how a computer works. Wow. It's very similar to a computer, if you think about yeah. it. And as time goes on, our wires and our resolution got smaller and smaller integrated circuits. Um, so our, man's design of computers is getting more and more like God's design of our eye wow. over time. So wow. man is evolving. Well, <laughs> man, no, I don't mean it that way. Um, we're behind God and trying to catch up, I should say. Well, as man combines their energies and their resources and their studies, systems improve. But energy-wise, that's a net cost on the universe, which is entropy. So we can learn more and more, but still the universe is winding down from lack of available energy. But thank you for sharing that, Bill. That was great. I said it okay. wrong the first time, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one I just learned about a day before I did my lesson for my creation group. 
So stare straight ahead and try to keep your eyes still. Even though you tried, you think your eyes still moved. What do you guys think? Oh, my eyes definitely moved. Okay. Well, everybody's eyes moved. They're called eye tremors, but don't worry, they're a beautiful thing. Your eyes, when you are looking, even if you try to keep your eyes still, they're moving with tiny little diameters. Mm -hmm. The diameter is 70th, 170th the thickness of a sheet of paper. So you can't even tell, but your eyes are moving in tiny little circles. Do you think that's a function or a flaw? A function. Function. It is a function. Why do they move in tiny little circles? By doing that, they are continu continually sending fresh data to your retina. If you could keep your eyes still, everything you're looking at would turn gray and then maybe even black after a while because you're not sending new data to your eyes. Isn't that cool? And plus, if something changes that you're looking at, then your brain can't process it. True, yep. Which is which could be very dangerous. Yep, wow. our brain, we, we send so much information to our brain. It's just incredible that it can process it. So if your retina does not send new information to the brain, what happens? Review time? Can you see gray or black? Yep. Things turn gray and perhaps black. Now, how do we protect? Oh, this is not a trick question. Did God design things to protect our precious eyes? Yes. Okay, just shout out anybody, all the whole group, shout out what designs protect our eyes. Eyelids. Lids. Eyelashes. Tears. Yeah, tears. Joyce said tears. <laughs> Hands. <laughs> the skull is designed to protect the eye. Yeah. Could you imagine if our eyes were bulging out, like the first thing that would be hit would be the eye? Like no, nope, the skull. The nose, it is impossible if you have a big flat hand to touch your eyeball because it's in the skull and the nose catches a lot of the... Delicious the, eyebrows. I mean. <laughs> yep. Don't pluck off all your eyebrows. They help protect your eyes, okay? <laughs> Ladies. You know, I guess dudes are doing it now too. But anyways, we won't go there. <laughs> well, somebody said tears. So let's talk about tears. Are tears simple or just a blob of water? Tears okay. are very complex. Tears are very, very complex. They have 1,500 proteins in oh tears. They have all kinds of enzymes to fight that are like antibiotics and other things, but 1,500 proteins are in your tears, but your tears have layers. Did you guys know that? No. Yeah. Three different liquids that are layered make up tears. So let's talk about that. Three layers make up your tear. Now the middle is the water, the lubricant with the proteins in it. But why do you have mucus between your water and your eye? Uh, so it sticks. The water, the water would leak out maybe. Right, the water would not stick to your eye and, you know, I'll talk about my dog. She gets these goo-goos in her eyes. And we do, too, when we wake up sometimes. That's often the mucus that keeps our tears attached to our eyes. Oh. Now, if I took you to Phoenix in September and it was 120 degrees, what would the water do? Oh, evaporate. Dry up. It yeah, it would evaporate. So God designed the outer layer to be oil to yeah. reduce the chance of evaporation. Any comments on that? Wow. 
my system of that is flawed, you know, because of mutations. I have dry eye syndrome, so I have to put extra oil and and salt water in them, or not salt water, but uh -huh. you know, water, like solution. Okay, so you don't have enough oil in your tears. Probably. I had to Here's get um, I had an eye doctor that would put um little plugs in the eye ducts. Yeah. The, so that the it wouldn't drain out, it would hold the liquid in my eye better. Oh, so when you blink, you can resurface lubricate. Yeah. And I have special glasses that I wear. These they're they're Therospecs, they're called FL41. So they're more than just blue blockers. They're um they're supposed to clip onto my glasses more easily, but they block out fluorescent lights too. So it helps with my dry eyes and it also helps with um, migraine relief. Oh, good. And hopefully soon they come up with more technology, but we know not only do we need to thank God for what he created, we need to thank God that we're in the United States where we have doctors who worked so hard and researchers who worked so hard. Amen. 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 Let's be thankful for our doctors. Mm. So, up oh, two minutes to go. You only <laughs> have one type of tear, true or false? False. False. Well, wow. <laughs> you have three types of tears. You have emotional tears. This <laughs> woman is really, really happy because she accepted Jesus as Lord. <laughs> And then there's sad tears, but they're both emotional tears. They're different type of tears. We have tears that come from cutting onions, like reflex tears. Is there a function to tears when you're cutting onions? You have to rid your body of toxins. Yep, they protect your eyes from something that could irritate your eyes. Smoke, dust, onion fumes. Yeah. And then there's reflex tears to wash away uh, intruders. Guess what reflex tears contain? Antibiotics. No, no. So if something does get into your eye, no, just... yes. Great mm. are the works of the Lord. Mm. Now the yeah. third type of tears are called guard tears. My dog is a pit bull, but she's not that much of a pit bull. <laughs> what a beautiful dog though, huh? Basal tears. These are on your eyes 24 seven that protect your eyes. Hmm. These are the tears that are the constant shield between the eye and the rest of your, and the rest of the world, keeping dirt away. So all day long, your basal tears lubricate and nourish your eye. Oh. <laughs> Bill, real quick question, real quick. Sure. Uh, do, all, do all three of those tiers, do they have the same chemical uh, uh, makeup or are they different chemically? I would bet a penny once again that they're different because some of them have antibiotics in them. Okay. But very, very good question. Here's a little praise report. Years ago, I had a blocked tear duct and I had this ugly little bump in my eye and my respected eye surgeon was gonna do surgery. And this is life advice for everybody in this room. Uh, she's a great doctor, I respect her. I went in for my surgery and she said, hey Bill, we have an eyelid expert here from Johns Hopkins visiting. Could he look at your, your eyelid and your tear ducts? I said, sure. And this very serious professional man looked at it. He goes, you know what? We can do surgery, but you want to try something else. And I said, sure, what is it? He recommended a home remedy that I hold something against my eye as much as I can for as long as I can for two weeks. Hmm. What do you guys think? He recommended that I hold up against my eye for two weeks to see if it could unblock the tear duct without surgery. Anybody want to guess? Something Ice. Like, I'm something sorry. Something irritating. No. Your finger. Nope. A wet tea bag. Nope. Ice. 
No, the exact the opposite of ice. Oh boy. We wanted oh, to open up the tear duct. A water bottle. A warm compress. Oh, oh a potato. A potato. A hot potato. <laughs> okay, this can change your life. Because of the eyes. No. <laughs> you could put a what. Well, I'm sure you guys might have done this. If I would have done a washcloth on my eye to hope, open up the tear duct, how long does a washcloth on your eye stay hot? Oh. A few seconds, right? Yeah. But what I did, and I hope this might benefit you guys someday, is I got all these little potatoes the size of a golf ball, and I kept microwaving them to the proper time where I wouldn't burn my eyelid. Put them in a nice dry uh, paper towel, and I would hold it on my eye, and they'd stay warm for about five minutes. So when I was working, I kept going to the microwave, microwaving <laughs> potatoes. But guess what happened? Your eye duct opened up. My eye duct opened up without surgery. No. And I profusely thanked that man. I said, you know, you probably could have made $3,000 doing surgery, mm -hmm. but you gave me advice that opened up the tear duct. Mm -hmm. So just remember, like, if you've got a muscle, you want to apply heat, potatoes hold heat for a long time. Mm -hmm. So anyways, any comments on that? Wow. And Ooh. hooray. <laughs> yep. Okay. I'm in the home stretch. Often the best argument for creation is what? <laughs> Listen yeah. to an evolutionist trying to explain how eyes came to be or anything. Yeah. Evolutionists are like a turtle on their back, flailing yeah. away, <laughs> hopeless, uh -huh. impotent, and frustrated. <laughs> but they brainwash the kids that they know what they're talking about. So let's look at some quotes. Over the course of the last 500 million years, evolution has produced an incredible variety of different eyes from a simple light sensitive spot. This has proved to be a major evolutionary step because created speecher, creatures enjoy clear advantages over blind or sighted creatures. And that's from Zeiss.com. Isn't that, isn't that pitiful? Yes. So how did we evolve eyes? Hmm. By evolution over 500 yeah. million years. Yeah. Yeah. Any evidence for that? None. None. No evidence. Here's the only man in America that you cannot criticize. Hmm. Charles Darwin. To suppose that, and you guys, I'm probably familiar with this, to suppose the eye with all its intimal contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, admitting of different amounts of light, which we talked about, the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely consist, confess, absurd in the highest degree. But later on, he says he does believe it happened by chance, even though he calls it absurd. Any comments on that? Too little, too late. <laughs> yeah. Sad. Pressure can do an awful lot to, um, to theories. He was yeah. angry at God. Please elaborate. He, he overthought it. Yes. Yes. He was an angry when I watch these Indian videos, the Indian scammers on YouTube, where they try to scam people out of money, they call it over smart. The Indians have a word, don't be over smart. Don't overthink something. Hmm. Now this is like a really nice guy. The eye has always been an organ of controversy for evolutionary biologists. Hmm. I should add an S there. Now the eye is not a controversy for creationists. The hearing hmm. eye and the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them. Hmm. Amen. So going back to this guy, he says the difference in eye structure between a spider and a human is so stark that it seems illogical that both eyes should be evolutionary related. 
there's a spider eye. They have several eyes. So this guy says it was therefore assumed. This is a science lesson, right? From this guy. Given the vast variety of eye structures found in nature that the eye must have arisen by random chance more than 40 individual times during evolution. Because look at all the differences in animal eyes. And for my August meeting at Garden Grove, I'm going to talk about different animal eyes. And they're all unique. Hmm. And if you think I'm making that up, you can look it up. Hmm. So assumptions must have pitiful, pitiful. Hmm. So this guy professing to be wise, and he's a PhD, is a fool. Okay, remember my very first slide, anybody? Yes, the um, eyeballs walking around with briefcase. <laughs> yeah. That's in honor of this man who has undoubtedly got a high IQ and a lot of knowledge, but he lacks what? Wisdom. Right. So he qu he's quoted as saying, Quite possibly, the human eye has originated from light-sensitive cells in the brain. Only later in evolution oh, would such brain cells have relocated into an eye and gained the potential to confer vision. Says the there man wearing says the man wearing um, eyeglasses that must have uh -huh. evolved for his face. Yeah. Yep. No. So these eye cells were in our brain and they said, hey, dudes, let's pack our suitcases and let's move into an eye so we can have vision. <laughs> Absolutely then, criminal. Yeah. Then the skull would have had to generate and evolve with holes in it. Oh, wait, you got to you got to evolve that optic nerve. Right. So they can travel. Yeah, but this and and the eye sockets weren't there then, I assume. And why not have four eyes? Wouldn't it be good to have two behind you? Yeah, yeah. Why didn't that happen? And not one eye, right? It's, <laughs> and you know, we, and we do chuckle, and it's humorous. But so many kids are being deceived. But if you only had one eye, it would be isolated. <laughs> good. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> this is a guy that I used to email a lot. I couldn't get ever pin him down. I think, how did the eye evolve? Well, we need eyes. I know, but how did they evolve? Well, we're better off with eyes. Carl Zimmer. He's a wannabe genius. Yeah. Complexity, they say, is not purely the result of millions of years of fine tuning through natural selection. So he's talking about complexity in the human body. Yeah. So he says complexity is to some extent, you guys ready? It just happens. Clearly, the result of millions of years of fine tuning. Oh, good night. Isn't that, wow. isn't that the magic ingredient for evolutionists? Is, is a salt shaker full of time, just add a little salt or add a little time and everything can, can work itself out. Yeah. The Bible teaches humans right. become salt, like Job's wife. I'm sorry, Lot's wife. Salt doesn't become humans. Just kidding. Hmm. Yeah, just that. Wow, what a genius. I'm so inspired by that. So he's a turtle laying on his back. But I guarantee you, if he took a truth serum, he would say his parents got divorced, his mother died, his brother died, or something tragic happened to turn him into such a hater of truth. So questions for evolutionists, what evolved first? Was it the eye, the optic nerve, the visual cortex? What part of the eye evolved first? <laughs> Cornea, pupil, iris, lens. Once again, these are what? Such a letter S? <laughs> Systems. Cone. What yeah. part of the system, system evolved first? What part of the cone yeah. evolved first? I <laughs> I think the rods and the cones were in those briefcases. Systems. <laughs> yep. Yeah. On the road again. <laughs> Systems can evolve by a step-by-step -step process. God mm -hmm. spoke it into existence instantly. Yes. Who would like to read this wonderful verse? Go ahead, Go ahead James. Oh. Glory to God in the highest. 
and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Luke 2, 14. Amen. Amen. So quick witnessing tips. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm talking to people and uh, I'm a Gideon and we're going to the Orange County Fair, which is a wonderful witnessing opportunity. I encourage the guys to consider becoming a Gideon. You can really reach a lot of people. But at the fair, I might say, and I'll say it to you guys, can I give you two reasons that prove God loves you or God made you? Your eyes. Your eyes are either the product of nature with an IQ of zero, pushing dust and dirt around randomly, or your eyes are the result of a God with an IQ of infinity. Mm. Very, very, very few people have ever pushed their atheism beyond that. Mm -hmm. Could I give you two reasons that shows that God loves you? Your eyes. <laughs> I tell people, no human will give you a better gift than your eyes. God gave you this gift because he loves you. Amen. So eyes Amen. prove God made you and God loves you. And again, all of you guys in this group and girls, women. Next time you're depressed, call a time out and thank God for five things, including vision. Mm -hmm. And that can push the blues away. Mm. So once again, please close your eyes. And thank God for vision. You may open your eyes. <laughs> so, question for you guys. Which design was your favorite? Oh, boy. I think the Let's tears see. are my favorite. I think it's very fascinating how they get, how they, how they help protect us and clarify things. I would say... I would say the cones and the rods and the little wires that there they that connects them to go into the that bigger nerve, like the little all the little wires connecting mm -hmm. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? I think mine would be more of an emotional uh, response. Um, to look into a person's eyes is like looking into his soul. And you can look at a person directly in his eyes and ask him questions. And um, he will avert his eyes from you if he feels um, um, that he cannot answer or if he feels awkward. And um, the eyes tell an awful lot. And just overall, I don't think we, we thought about that, but that's because I believe they're so connected to the brain and that um, this would be another, another factor of why they're connected to the brain. Mm. And one of my witnessing tips is to never wear sunglasses. Why not? <laughs> so people can look into your soul. I think we communicate <laughs> compassion with yes. our eyes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. You guys ever heard of David? Uh, oh, what was it? Oh, the son of Sam Killer. Oh, 1977. David. Well, anyways, hmm. you remember the son of Sam Killer? Oh, my. In New York City? Yes. Okay, this guy, he had a Jewish last name, like Markowitz or something, or Horowitz. Yeah. But anyway, Berkowitz. pictures Berkowitz. of him. I'm, I'm sorry. Berkowitz. Berkowitz. I think Berkowitz. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much for sharing that. David Berkowitz. <laughs> when he got arrested, and I've done this, look at his eyes. He looks like a crazy, demon possessed animal. Hmm. Do you know what happened to him in prison? No. Hmm. He is a born again believer. He leads Bible studies. He completely <laughs> loves Jesus. And look at his eyes now. Maybe I should have made a slide out of that. <laughs> Gentle, compassionate, completely remorseful. But the poor man did admit that he had demon possession. <laughs> and his eyes communicate that. Any comments <laughs> on that? 
Yeah, they do or do not communicate that. They do. Do. Some of these crazed killers, their eyes are just not right. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Yeah. But well, Berkowitz's Bill, eyes changed. Um, we have a couple of questions um, real quick before we wrap things up here. So um, first, <laughs> let's do this one. What is the hardest question that atheists ask that are most difficult to answer? Can you come up with one? Just yesterday, I was talking to my friend. And I say to atheists, sometimes when I witness, I say, you know what? You guys really are not asking the toughest questions you could ask. And they'll say, well, what should we be asking? And I say, you figure it out. <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you want to stop recording, I would be happy to share what I think the best atheist questions could be, but I actually do not want to record them because let them, let them figure out their strongest challenges. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, and, well, before we do that, um, we have one question of um, when do you, can you tell us when you have your monthly meetings and where? Our monthly meetings are the first Saturday of the month and they're typically on Facebook. The first Saturday at five o'clock, and we record them typically in Garden Grove, California, Calvary Chapel, West Grove. Okay, and do you can you um, re tell us the name of your Facebook group? Is it? Um... If you do Calvary Chapel Creation Science. Okay, yeah, I think okay. Up. Creation Science at Calvary Chapel West Grove is the name of your group. So. Okay, right. Yeah. And then Good. do you want to remind people how they can find you on YouTube and your website? Yeah, my website is pitiful. At, and that's totally on me. <laughs> uh, my YouTube channel is Bill Morgan Channel. And I, I post a lot of evangelism stuff and creation stuff and things like that because when i witness very very rarely do i get into a science debate with the average person but the main thing people say well i'll just quiz you guys my, my favorite witnessing question by far that i think i've shared in the past please remember this if you want to share your faith politely ask somebody what do you think will happen to you after you die You could hand someone a Bible, like the Gideons do, and they take the Bible, and I say, can I ask you a question? That's the best first question, because that opens it up. They say, sure, and people like to be asked questions. Yeah. And then you politely ask, what do you think will happen to you after you die? And I ask with respect. Hmm. What do you think some of the answers are, people? Nothing. Okay, if they say nothing, I say, I respect that, but now you got to role play with me. Do you believe in God? Yeah. Um, so, so <laughs> for time's sake, you, you're saying you have videos like that on your YouTube right. channel that go through these. Right. And if they say they don't believe in God, I use the eyes. If yeah. they do believe in God, and I think this answers the suffering question, I'll go through this real quick. Do you think God made you just to see loved ones die and then your body falls apart and you die and that's it. Oh. What is the purpose of life? Mm. Is the purpose of life to see, have a little fun, see a lot of suffering and then die? No, real quickly, a loving God, I think the purpose of life is to go to heaven. Mm. Seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God. I believe kingdom. the whole purpose of life is to go to heaven and we go to heaven if we can endure the trials of this temporary existence and still trust and love our creator. Overcome. Exactly. Exactly. Overcome and still love God. Hmm. But to me, that answer is suffering. If this was our only life, I would agree with people that God is a sadist. Wait, he made us to get cancer? Well, thanks a lot. No, he made us for eternal life. Can we still love him during the trials? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So Terry, with your eye problems, if you persevere, God blesses that. The Sermon on the Mount teaches mm -hmm. that. But anyways, that's my quickie on that. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bill. So people can find you on YouTube, um, Bill Morgan channel, and your website, um, fishdontwalk.com. Is that correct? <laughs> correct. And of course, um, you can find our ministry partner, Throughout All Ages Ministries, at throughoutallages.com. And then you can find links to all four of our social media platforms by typing in tinyurl.com forward slash cf santi santi is s-a-n-t-e-e -E. you can also email us at creationfellowshipsanti at gmail.com so you can get on our mailing list and you won't miss out on any upcoming speakers and speaking of which in two weeks we want to remind everybody that we're having a big um, event. We're having Trevor Loudon come to discuss the documentary Enemies Within the Church. So we are encouraging everybody oh, to wow. go to enemieswithinthechurch.com, order, um, you can get it on DVD or you can download it, watch it, um, be prepared to ask questions on July 28th. With that, thank you so much for being with us tonight, Bill Morgan. Thank you. It was an honor and privilege. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Very welcome. And I'll send you my slides, Terry. And if the other people want them, they can get them from you. Oh, wonderful. My PowerPoint slides.